trail and ultra runners what is going on what's happening welcome to another episode of the coop cast as always i am your humble host coach jason coop and on this episode of the podcast we have one of the coach that i respect and admire the most in the space today and one of the most sought after mountain bike coaches in the country that is cts coach adam pulford You longtime listeners of the podcast will recognize Adam from a previous podcast where we talked all about creating resilient athletes, which is something that Adam is actually quite good at. I have seen Adam develop as a coach over the years, and one of the things that is always the most impressive about him is his willingness to put himself in the firing line of any new training intervention or any new technology that comes across the wire. He takes these things, adopts them, figures out what is useful for athletes and what is not useful useful for athletes. He brings it into our coaching department and he uses those things with his athletes in his own coaching practice. And I wanted this conversation to revolve around that, to be a normal coaching conversation, one of many that Adam and I have had over the course of years that has made me a better coach and hopefully will make you a better athlete. Be forewarned. There's some salty language right out of the get-go on the other side of this intro. So if you have sensitive ears or if you have kids in the room, skip ahead a few minutes. Most of that salty language will be gone, but it does come a little hot and heavy because we start out talking about two things that are very prevalent in the endurance space right now. And we give kind of the rolly eyes to, for those of you that are not uh, watching the YouTube vi- uh, version of this. And that is near Vanderpool's training, which was all the rage when we recorded this, which is right at the conclusion of the Winter Olympics, as well as zone two training or low intensity training. We will give you our off the cuff remarks about those two things right out of the gate. So with that as a little bit of a backdrop, here we go. Let's get right into it. I'm going to get right out of the way. This is my conversation with CTS coach, Adam Pulford. What up, dude? Long time yeah, no joke. Um, yeah, all good here. Just um, just got off the trainer doing some good zone two work. You know? so t- that we should talk about that, man. That's like, you can't get away from zone two right now. Fuck. Well, you know, I did my... <clears throat> I did my two hours of speed skating and then my seven hours on <laughs> on the on the bike. Um, I swear to God, if like near Vanderpool's training gets analyzed by one more coach or entity, I might lose my shit. It's, it's just like how many like really like I appreciate like, like this is cool. Let's go ahead and look yeah. at it. But goddamn, like it's a shit ton of volume and reasonable intensity distribution. Yeah period exactly it's like great you you were motivated to do a lot of volume you have the time cool um and yeah there's there's nothing wrong with it i mean in fact i was like oh no what i loved about it was how he how he explained his process like not too many athletes i think are that self-actualized to be able to put everything down and i actually enjoyed like the more of the the less the training and more of the um mindset around how he chose to do what he did because it, it gave more gave more insight to his psyche or just like the person who he is and um i appreciated that yeah i i i, I agree with that every time somebody does something amazing this and they put something out like this it comes around i mean I can, you and i can yeah. both remember when matt carpenter did that yeah you know, kind of close to when he retired or whatever we're calling that now. It was the same thing. Everybody <laughs> mm-hmm. scrutinized, you know, what he did. What are we going to learn from it and all that stuff? But for whatever reason, this one, I don't know what it is. Yeah, I've it, had... it's getting like, I'm like, like I, my whole Twitter feed is full, full of it. Like, I'm just... <laughs> yeah, and I, and, I, and I would say like, um, I actually read it when you sent it to me, but I've had multiple athletes other coaches like Boucher sent it to like Boucher of all people who has like no time. Cause he's just hanging out with his kids and coaching athletes. Um, he read it and I was like, really? But yeah, it's, it's, it's hot right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave all this in by the way. 
<laughs> it's great because this is the way it should go. Um, uh, all right, man, let's kick it off, dude. Uh, yeah, like it. I said, I always like shooting this shit with you. We should do more of this, by the way, just as a aside. I'm uh, always up for it. I'm yeah, we it. we should like uh, we we can talk off air about how to how to carve that thing out. Um, well, uh, first of all, I just want to get something off my chest. You good. you like kind of like strava shamed me earlier this week <laughs> where i was scrolling through realized my premium subscription to strava was up and was like gone for like four months or something I'm like i'm like you know that didn't really bother me but i saw a coop doing his coupelings of like you know three hours and 20 some miles or whatever the hell it was and i was like look good looking i'm like coop you got more mileage than i do as a cyclist this week it's only Wednesday, but it's not even a week, and you're already like crushing me. Well, I mean, I I did. Uh, the the only reason for that is I went out to Arizona and I was training on the Cocodona 250 course, which is a race that I'm training for. So I kind of set aside a training camp for myself. So it's a little artificially inflated. Whew, that makes me feel so. Much I did not about realize myself. though that you were so invested in my Strava account that I would Strava shame you without me prompting it. Well, the one time a month I look at Strava, it really really gets to me that's why i just put it away now for a while so i think you need to reevaluate your value system yeah i might i might resubscribe to the premium membership i don't know uh strava was actually one thing that i was that i gave up we could talk we'll start and talk about this yeah i'm giving up strava this year no no offense to strava i think it's a cool platform Mm -hmm. um but i don't use it professionally you know we use training peaks and i found myself not checking into it you know and so I'm like, you know what? This is something I could do without. So I didn't give it up. Yeah, uh, I think that's great. I mean, I admittedly <laughs> gave it up um, without even knowing it. Because <laughs> again, like the premium membership lapsed. I can't, like, I don't know. I don't use it either, like professionally. However, every time I go on there, which is probably even like less than once a month, I am amazed at, not amazed, Um I like the evolution of their analytics yeah, and it yeah. is really rich for people who don't say have training peaks or other training tools at their fingertips. Cause it does do a really good job and it does a fantastic job of, um, you know, categorizing the segments. Right. So yeah. it, kudos to, to Strava. However, yes, I'm, I'm not a huge user of it. I might miss the routes function. Cause I did yeah. use that a lot. They, they did a great job with that, but they made the the decision very, early on and very deliberately to not intentionally or I guess exclusively like cater towards the coaching market Mm -hmm. and it shows up in the way their 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 product is is uh the all the product features that are in front of users right now whether where it's a user first experience versus a coach first experience and which is cool and there's nothing wrong with that it's just it is it is what it is but I only have so much bandwidth and so I decided totally. to eliminate that one out of the mix. Facebook might be on my next one. I'm like on the edge. So check back in a month and I might might be off that too. So like real quick, just on the socials, all right. Um I find myself consuming less and less. I mean, I, I still <clears throat> I still put some stuff out there, especially on Instagram, but like definitely consuming less. I, I feel like athletes are like over it. Uh social media it's dead. Really? What do you really? think about that? Yeah. Wow. But because group text is like oh. thing, you know, in terms of like the conversation, like there's plenty of media, there's plenty of content out there, but yet I'm like a little intimidated too, because when you got like, I don't know, when you've got these professional athletes throwing out there, their, their sick edits from their team camp and they got <laughs> like, and I like post a selfie with my like old iPhone, it's like, I'm not getting my clicks, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And meanwhile, I can just send a group text to Jane and Coop and they'll be like, ha ha ha. And that's all I really need otherwise. Yeah. Well, I mean, it depends if you're in it for your, you know, your own kick, your own shits and giggles, then I think you're right to limit it to your group text. I've always looked at it though, as a service, right? I mean, if I can put content out there that's a service to people and helps people train or inspires them or whatever that's kind of how i like the that's how i like 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 to use that that platform so it's not necessarily for me i guess is what i'm getting at. in fact I, we talked about this at our coaching summit mm-hmm. i don't even look at any of the metrics or anything like that 
like I don't look at the likes or shares or how many, I don't even know how many followers I have on all these platforms. Like I don't use that as a, as a marker for success. I really do look at it through the lens of, is this going to help somebody? Is it going to be a service to somebody? And if somebody sends me uh, like a direct message or some, or something mm -hmm. like that, either on Twitter or on Instagram, like I, I'm pretty, it's, it's a horrible workflow, <laughs> but I, I try to, res, I try to respond to, to all of those. I can't say that I do hundred percent of the time. Because some of them get lost, yeah. lost in the weeds, but it, that just tells me that there's people out there that are listening that are, that are into it. Totally. I, I got to do a better job of that myself. Like when I do put content out there, it does take me a while to, well, takes me a while to create it in the way yeah, that right. I'm doing it. Yeah. Right. That's like consumable by, but, but, but people actually super enjoy that. Right. I think with you on Twitter, like you're pretty active there and you're sharing a lot of really good research. I th you definitely read more research than I do right now. So I always, you're one of the people that I go to for um, what is some of the latest and greatest of what to read. Um, so I appreciate that. But then, but yeah, I, I just, I think, I'm consuming less social media. I don't yeah, think that's a bad good thing. for you. Yeah. Tw tw having lists in Twitter, we shared this mm -hmm. in our coaching group a couple of days ago. Um, having lists in Twitter, I think is that's, that's, <laughs> that's the most power. I'm going to tell you why I'm laughing in a second. That's the most powerful way to get a hold of the right research. It is not easy though, because mm -hmm. the amount of terrible information out there to the amount of good information, it's like 20 to one or maybe even 50 to one. So you have mm -hmm. to have a really good filter on it. And it's hard It's really, really hard to, um, to do that. The reason I'm laughing is I made the analogy is, is that 2021 or 2022 now, 2022's Twitter lists and how you can use that for physiology is like the early 2000s version of our interns that would comb through all of the, uh, all the scientific uh, publications that would come into our office and like rip out and, you know, photocopy the pages, <laughs> which is a way more efficient process. Yeah. <laughs> all totally. right, let's get into new stuff, man. This is too, all right, let's too do much it. banter. Let's see how many people are tuned in after this. Yeah, um, they already stopped listening. For sure. All right, all right. So I wanted to talk to you about new stuff that that I'm excited about and that you're excited about. So I, I'm going to kick it off. This is something that, uh, first off, I like talking to you about because I feel like you have your finger on the pulse of a lot of this stuff from mainly from the cycling world, but there's also crossover into other mm. endurance disciplines, obviously. And I've always appreciated your take on it because it, you take it for what it is, as opposed to sometimes yeah. what it's being pitched to be, um, mm. which is very, which is very rare. And that's <clears throat> part of the filtering process that I was alluding to earlier on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I want to kick around is a new, is a new biosensor a new wearable sensor that is, it, you can't even get it right now. Right. They had yeah. their official launch at the running event, which is a big running industry trade show in Austin in December. And I, I wasn't even planning on talking to these people until I actually got there. Hmm. But it's a company called Nix Biosensors and they make a wearable patch that most people will probably if you were to look at it it looks like a continuous glucose monitor so it's a little two inch patch that you stick on your skin and then it connects via bluetooth to your smartphone and it measures sweat rate and the amount of uh, the concentration of of the total amount of electrolytes in your sweat i was trying to make sure i said that correctly because it's not yeah. just sweats to sodium it's the total concentration of all the electrolytes in your sweat which is mainly sodium yep. but when i first saw this and i kind of like watched it from afar and then i stalked them for a little bit when they didn't know i was i was like looking at them just to like see their technology and all that kind of stuff the first thing I could think about is this actually solves a problem that I want to solve. Because hmm. because when you think about it, in especially in an ultra endurance application, trying to get a fix on your hydration rate and also your hmm. electrolyte composition is really clumsy, right? We've kind of have like the de facto way to do it is you go out and you run or you ride, you weigh yourself before, you weigh yourself after, and that's your sweat rate for that particular bandwidth of temperature and at that intensity and in order to create a profile for an athlete across different in, across different temperature ranges it's re a really clumsy process and it's kind of rife with inaccuracies and things like that and then you don't even get the electrolyte composition like that's a really sophisticated thing that you have to 
somebody's got to have a machine or even doing the whole body sweat, uh, uh, sweat composition tests are really invasive where they've got to wash people yeah. off and measure everything. Like those tests are just, it's just really, really, inv- it's very, very clumsy to do. And so this is something that is very practical and it solves a problem that, 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 that I think is a worthy one of solving where you can very easily create a sweat rate profile for an athlete just by having them wear this monitor. And apparently it lasts for 24 hours. So you could literally go out and do a really long training run Mm -hmm. across a wide temperature range, starting in the morning and in the evening or something like that. And that could be your, you know, your kind of test case to develop a sweat profile for it. The interesting part of it, and this is, because the product's not released, so who knows how this comes out, is they actually give you via the app the recommendations on what to consume. And you can customize it via, I want to, I want it by time, I want it by amount of, I want a trigger based on an amount of loss. So every time you lose four ounces or whatever, you can kind of customize those triggers and it'll give you a prompt to drink you know, X kind of X, Y, Z amount or whatever. And in addition to that, it'll match up your electrolyte, the electrolyte composition in your sweat with the products that are out on the market. So you can kind of match that as well. If you're, uh, you know, I was going to say heavy sodium sweater, but that's not the correct term. And you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. If you're a, if you're a salty sweater or or a dilute sweater, you can try to match, you can try to product match in that kind of in that fashion. But I think where the rubber meets the road is, is what is the recommendation going to be? Because we don't know for sure. And this is likely, this is likely the case that a one-to-one replacement is appropriate across all endurance disciplines. And what I mean by that is if you lose four ounces, should you actually replace four ounces? And the answer to that is it's probably less, but we don't know how much less. Maybe it's between like 95 and 85% or maybe 90% is kind of like the current working theory, but it's certainly not 100%. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I don't know how they're going to get around that. Anyway, that's the first thing that I wanted to kick around with you is the application of this new product out there called Nix Biosensors. And there's no affiliation between them and Adam, nor myself, nor, nor CTS. I just kind of appreciate, I just kind of appreciate what they do. I put in my pre-order. I ordered like, I think I ordered eight of them and I'm going to send them out to a few athletes. So what do you think, Adam? <clears throat> Would you use this as a coach or as an athlete? What do you think? about? It? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I think that Anytime that we get some new technology like this, if it's good, um, I'm always I'm always going to want to play with it. Okay, see how it works, see what we can see in the field relative to what we've known in the laboratory setting for a while. Um, I've never used this. In fact, in this um, Nix biosensor, like you sent it over to me, and I've seen a couple other things that are um, adjacent to, but not not the same. Right. So I was like, oh yeah, this is pretty cool. And it, it is very, it looks very similar to the glucose sensor of which I've had quite a bit of experience with. And I would say I, you know, with, um, just a little caveat with that glucose sensor is like, I think I was pretty excited to see, um, data from that and then overlay it onto training. This is, it's kind of like a training peaks dashboard with glucose that we can now see in real time with athletes of where their glucose are while they're exercising or at rest and all this kind of stuff. And then give recommendations of what to consume when not as sophisticated as what you just alluded to with this Nix biosensor. Um, but there, and so, and then it's like, well, how do you use it? Well, there's some practical application, but again, it, it verified what we knew in the laboratory setting before. So I think that it, um, it brought to light good habits or bad habits within an athlete. And it helped us to refine those habits and also prepare really good leading into a competition. I think with this, um, in particular with, with hydration, I think it's awesome because you've got different sweat rates for different athletes. Sure. But also different sweat rates for different climates. Right. And I think when you're trying to dial in an athlete with a product relative to the environment, it's going to really help uh, solve that problem or, or gather more information so that you can make better choices as an athlete. So then you've got your like 
high and dry nutrition hydration. You've got your low and sticky, you know, this kind of thing. And with all these sensors, it's, I don't view it as like you wear it all the time and you become like this bionic athlete. It's you wear it for a certain time period to gather information and refine your process. Then you go and do. Meanwhile, you better be scrub. You better be asking these questions of how do I feel? How does changing this make me feel? Did I know this about myself and get to be super in tune with yourself? Cause that's what these little biosensors and, and wearables and all this kind of stuff. That's what it's intended to do as opposed to become the soldier athlete. That yeah, question. I, I think that what, with, with all these things, this is the ultimate, this is the ultimate problem that all of the wearables are faced with is they have to provide value out. They have to provide value above and beyond giving you the data back because most yeah. people don't know what to do with the data and most people are lay consumers. Mm-hmm. The aura ring has this issue. The whoop strap has this issue. All the biosensors are going to continue from a, from a business standpoint to have this issue of, okay, we can collect all this data. Now, how are we going to inform the user as to how to apply that to their day-to-day life or, or, or day-to-day training? And even as something as simple as drink more or drink less, which is kind of what Nix is coming down to, right? That's still a tricky thing to figure out across everybody that is using your product. And in my estimation where the, a lot of the wearables have kind of gone awry is they've tried to overcomplicate the process to, to justify the value proposition of the device itself. And they do that through proprietary algorithms where whether it's a, you know, your battery getting recharged or your recovery score or your readiness score or whatever there, those are just ways to kind of masquerade the data that they're actually getting back or take the data that they're getting back and masquerade it as something valuable for the user in order to prove the value proposition of the, you know, hundreds of dollars type of, Uh, type of device that you have. But here you have something kind of to bring it back to the original point that where it solves a real world problem, right? Hydration. It does it in a simplistic fashion. It makes a very big difference, right? We know that especially in hot and humid climates, hydration is is one of the key driving factors of hydration electrolyte balance is one of the key driving factors in, in, in performance. And in addition to that, as you started to allude to that I'm going to tack on to, it's a complicated set of variables because not only do you have the individual variation variations in the sweat rate, you also have the individual variations in the electrolyte concentration within each individual, right? The classic Mm -hmm. GSSI bell curve, where it can be anywhere from, you know, 200 milligrams of sodium per, you know, per liter all the way up to maybe a gram, you know, of, a, of sodium equivalent per, uh, per, per liter of sweat. And that's a huge variation. And then you also have the intensity component, right? So you've got all these variables that play into what sweat rate and what sweat, what electrolyte composition is actually in the sweat that make it a hard problem to solve for versus, and I'm going to pick on the continuous gluco, glucose monitors a little bit, that's more of a def- that's much more of a contained variable, right? We know that people can only tolerate so much carbohydrate per hour. And you can go out and you can field test that very kind of very regularly, where the only consequence is is a kind of kind of an upset stomach. And so by being able to monitor glucose, which a, which is what a continuous glucose monitor will do, you're getting feedback across this across this performance variable or this 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 variable that can improve performance that is really not all that complicated i guess is what i'm saying you you have like ways out in the field of kind of like trial and erroring it where whereas when i see when i look at hydration i just think it i just it just is much more complicated and we see this at the at the finish line right we see this at the finish mm-hmm. line of major races where mm-hmm. more people are hyponatremic right mm-hmm. than they have low blood glucose way like way more people and we, we can go back and look at all the ultra distance and ultra marathon kind of uh, research to 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 kind of to kind of tease that out which leads me to believe that the hydration issue is just a harder problem to solve than the fueling one well 
Coop, you and I have done enough camps <clears throat> and did the nutrition hydration talks. And, and one thing that we've always <laughs> said is um, the best nutrition plan doesn't work on a dehydrated gut, right? Yeah. right. So it's, you know, hydration. I'm not going to say it's any less complicated than regulating glucose because what I learned through the process is it's actually pretty complicated, but you also got different tanks to pull from in, in stored muscle glycogen, as well as exogenous uh, glycogen that, that can do. And then there's enough regulatory systems in place to make you slow down and then pull from so that you don't go super low. And so in that though, like this glucose number that we see, it's also just, it's just, it's measured in the, um, kind of interstitial fluids. It's not like, uh, measuring your direct glycogen in your muscles and all this kind of stuff. So right. th that being aside, it's definitely not perfect. And I would say I'm doing less with it than I anticipated I would now with hydration though, I still to kind of be a little critical about this too. I hope that this sensor could give us more information. We don't know if it will or not. Right. Like, <laughs> sounds yeah, I mean, they said their validation studies give it with, and I had Meredith, their CEO on my, on my podcast a few weeks ago, I'll, I'll yep. put a link to that in the show notes. And they're pretty, they're pretty apparent about the degree of accuracy to which they, they, they can detect both the sodium rate and the electrolyte composition of the sweat. And it's within, it's within a tolerance that makes it practical. Right. It wouldn't be clinical, meaning mm -hmm. if you needed to get within 1% right. accuracy for a you know, very precise dose of something, this is not going to do it. In fact, there's for probably sure. not anything out there that could do it. No, but from a pragmatic sense. point of view, it definitely gets you close enough. And it's all almost like the precision hydration um, mm -hmm. uh, philosophy where they just use a low, medium, high in terms of uh, the sodium composition of your sweat. So they go, you go and you get a, a resting uh, sweat sodium uh, test and they put you into one of three, but they might actually have four buckets now. They might've created like a super high, mm -hmm. super high bucket because of their, their population that they're working with, but they're not trying to say, okay, Adam, you know, you need a drink that's 500, uh, 523 milligrams of sodium per liter and coop, you need one that's 560 milligrams of sodium per liter. They're not getting that precise. It's like 500, 1000, 1500. Like that's the, that's the degree of granularity 500 being the, the amount of milligrams of sodium per liter of fluid. That's the amount of precision that they're getting. It, it's very, very similar to that. Um, I, once again, I haven't seen the output, but that's the way that she was she was describing it. I don't want to oversell the utility either, because I honestly think you get, you build a profile with an athlete with like four or six tests mm -hmm. and then that's it. Yep. You know, may, maybe sure. there's some race day application, you know, I mean, we, you went through this with the super sapiens continuous glucose monitors. Maybe there's a race day application where it's like reminding you to drink a la, a la the old Timex watches that you would set on 30 minute intervals to try to remind you to eat, right? Maybe there's, there's some application there, but in terms of building a hydration profile, which I think is the, the value, pro the main value proposition here, you go and do four or six tests, you build that profile, and then you've got enough data to really work from whenever you're faced with a race situation that's different than your day-to-day -day training environment. Yeah, that, that's it. I think it's, um, I think that's it. it because a lot of these tools are like awareness tools and yeah. verification tools, right? So if you got an athlete who's not super aware of their hydration, that's very bad, right? And as a coach, oh, <laughs> hopefully I haven't been coaching them for too long, but you can bring awareness to do this simply by talking about it, practicing all this kind of stuff. This I think would expedite the process. It would also verify what the coach is saying or whoever else is saying as put, cause it, I've had and heard of, you know, athletes say, Oh no, I have been all these problems with my nutrition or hydration. And then they go get sweat tested or, um, they, they get tested in terms of, um, um, what they're putting out. And so the answer is putting more in. Right. And then they do that. But sometimes it's like, uh, <laughs> Jane had this problem with, uh, I can't remember the, well, whoever the guy's name was, it was basically, she was saying, eat more, eat more. He goes and gets tested or eat more and drink more. So what he yeah. well. and so, yes, that was the, the outcome was he needed to eat more and consume more uh, sodium as but well. He needed the data in order. He wouldn't listen he to needed Jane. The data. Jane. Shout yeah. out to Jane Marshall, our, our yeah. mutual friend and colleague. She, yes. He wouldn't listen to Jane, but he'd listen to the number on his watch. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's what I'm talking about is like, 
sometimes us coaches need these verification widgets to to get the point across and that's fine um but yeah i I don't see it moving beyond you know beyond that four to six test unless something changes right unless you've got you know hormonal change within the athlete unless you're right have a new challenge right that you're going to go into environment you've never done before um but it's super cool because to be able to put this into practice is also um really interesting yeah, the venture capital market is not going to like that proposition, by the way. The They're fact not. that the the fact that the utility is fairly well contained, right? And the use mm-hmm. case that they can get out of athletes is fairly well contained. Everybody loves subscription models right now. And this is kind of one of the problems that's plaguing the the wearable industry is they're they're becoming too too reliant on a financial model that it that doesn't suit the the utility of the device, essentially. Yep. That's yep. neither here nor there. So you, Adam, you mentioned this a few times, and mm-hmm. I, I personally want to know more about this. So we'll do it in the kind of the podcast audience. You spent a lot of time testing out for yourself and then also amongst some of your athletes, some of the continuous, some of the applications with the, with a continuous glucose monitor. Can you kind of like take me through like a, you're going to have to do a little bit of background for the rest of the audience on like what, mm-hmm. what it is and how you're using it. But then B, this is where I get to satiate my, you know, personal curiosity with this is ultimately what, like, what's the function of it now, now that you've had access to it for a long period of time and you can really flush out, this is how I'm using it. And this is how I'm not using it. I kind of want to know how it transpired over the course of the last several months. Yeah. So it's almost, we're kind of kind of rounding about a year right now, um, that I've been on sensor and use and have athletes that are on sensor. And so to kind of define it, um, simplistically is a continuous glucose monitor. A CGM is a little, uh, stickable patch that goes on your upper arm for the human performance aspect of what we're doing. And this device has a little filament that upon application goes into your skin. And then it has a, uh, like a waterproof seal that goes around the device. The device is maybe as big as a half dollar <laughs> sort of if people can remember coins. Yeah. Um, and it's super lightweight. Um, when you attach the device to yourself, you honestly can't feel it. Um, so, some people have a little twinge, but whatever it's, and then, but this filament is kind of living inside you. The device is good for about 12 days or so. Um, some people 10 to 14, but the device has some local memory on it itself. It gets paired to your phone and the super sapiens application is only available in Europe and a few other countries, not yet available in the United States. So um, there's a few things around that, but it's the FDA regulating it. That's kind of like holding up in the U S market. So the theory was when Phil Sutherland uh, race bikes. He was a type one diabetic and he was always managing his glucose throughout his racing career. What he noticed is that people's food habits or fellow racers habits that are, that weren't diabetic, (laughs) they would have these crashes and bonks. And so in theory, he's like, how can I take this technology and information that I learned and apply it to non-diabetic folk that are racing or interested in human performance or just biohacking. And so whether you're an endurance athlete, and this is kind of where my um, section was, I was uh, a group of 30 coaches that got the super sapiens university. And it was like three months of um, education, onboarding, all this kind of stuff. And in those 30 coaches, there were some endurance focus like myself. And then there was some like strength and kind of like crossfit and like keto folk, um, that were, uh, really into keeping their glucose levels low. Whereas I was like, let's burn it hot. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the, I like me and, uh, another Brad Huff, he, or like hashtag don't be as scared of the spike. Cause it's like, right. Glucose right. is like anything right. when you're, when you go fast, you push it on the gas pedal, speed goes up, glucose goes up. Okay. And this is how it works inside your body. And this is what we're measuring. So in theory, when you're not exercising, when you're not training, we call that off hours, glucose levels are stable, fairly low. The numbers are somewhere between 70 and 90, maybe hundred. As you go hard or start to exercise, it'll go up to the upper end of that. You go harder, it goes over that. It's not bad to go high. In fact, elite athletes 
those who can push hard for a long period of time can hold high glucose levels for a long time. Right. Why does this matter? Why does this make sense? The theory or the concept was to identify what your glucose levels are during hard training and then fuel accordingly. So if you're going to spike up high, try to keep your glucose within a certain zone, sort of like training zones, power zones, pace zones, this kind of thing. And then during the off hours, try to keep your glucose in non-training mode and to minimize inflammation and all this other stuff. So as athletes and myself have worn it, monitor it, what have we learned? Well, like I said before, we've kind of learned what we already knew to be true, which is if you want to have a really good day with lots of fuel, it starts 24 to 48 hours out. It's not just day of because you're going to burn through all your fuel uh, very quickly if you start with a half a tank, right? Meanwhile, during the training session, drink early, drink often, eat early, eat often, this sort of thing. Also, the food types kind of varies within certain people, and I can give a few examples of that, but in general, it's, it's awareness tool to see how you respond to different food types, whether it's pure carbohydrate, think of like white rice or really refined sugar or something like this, um, or combine that with some fat and how your glucose will respond and then how your body responds to that. Um, and I will stop talking and go to you. <laughs> well, the one thing I could think about is like, we, we have to remember that it's measuring glucose. Mm -hmm. Just pause. That's what you're measuring. Mm -hmm. And yes, we can measure the acute rises and falls and spikes. Don't be afraid of the spike. I'll, just, I'll go off on another tangent with that in, in glucose, but that's one aspect of performance. It's an important one, but it's just one aspect of, of performance. And you also have to realize, particularly in really long events, and we have to remind ourselves this is mainly an ultra marathon audience <clears throat> that we also have to manage GI distress. And there's not necessarily a coupling between the glucose spikes and falls that you're going to see on your CGM and ultimately how that transpires in GI distress. In fact, if anything, the fact that you see the rises and falls means that you're constantly dumping glucose from your stomach into your bloodstream and you actually want to see that versus it yeah. sitting in your gut for a long period of time and potentially creating that GI distress. So it, it, I mean, I remember when these came out and I mean, the writing was on the wall, I think initially in terms of the use case, the use case where you're going to initially inform, you're going to initially use it to inform your practice and help, you know, maybe drive home messages with athletes that weren't receiving the message in the first place. Mm -hmm. But then the, like the long-term utility, I think still remains a little bit of a question, meaning are we going to see these on athletes arms in the next 10 years? in the Tour de France, like we see power meters on athletes bikes in the Tour de France. Once again, power meter is just giving us a number back, right? It's telling us the torque and angular velocity at the level of the crank arm or the wheel, wherever you're measuring it. And we see it on athletes bikes because it's a useful metric to have in real time after the fact in order to do analysis to inform training and things like that. And I always wonder, is something like this going to have that type of have that type of longevity where five or 10 years from now, the data is so useful that athletes kind of can't at that level, kind of can't, not can't race without it, but find it a benefit to race with, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, personally, I don't think so. I, I don't think we'll, we'll get there. And, and, and that's my criticism. Some people will argue with me. Um, the UCI seems, I mean, they banned it in, in competition. You can't wear it during UCI sanctioned events, uh, because they don't want racing to become bike racing to become NASCAR, which is silly. Um, however, I do think that, I, I do think that it is useful, especially when somebody is struggling with their, their nutrition, right? Just like we talked about with hydration, yeah. but I do think that, yeah, you go maybe four sensors to get in, in what I recommend is like wear one change, nothing for two weeks, right? Just do your training. Yeah, sure. Just yeah. consume as you are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then be off sensor for a little bit. Cause again, it's numbers. I've had some athletes that are like, cool. I'll put it on. I'm not going to look at it. You look at it, but I want to see it. <laughs> cool. Great. Um, so then the second one is, um, put it on, do really hard training. 
right? And then change nothing. Third one is maybe manipulate your diet. So what I did was uh, I went like super low carb for, I wanted to say a week. I think I only made it like five or six days. <laughs> I was about to say, I know you, that doesn't last very long. <laughs> Jeez. I, and I've done, I mean, I've gone low carb just for curiosity purposes yeah, yeah. in the past, but like, this was great because I mean, I was super low. I was not spiking bro, but like, <laughs> I just felt terrible. Absolutely terrible. First couple of days eating like bacon and avocados and stuff is great, but um, I had no glycogen. I needed a carbohydrate. Uh, it, so manipulate, do something silly just to see what happens with right. your body. And then also at some point have, you know, either a block of racing or, or a main competition or something like this, where you just gather to see how your body goes over the long run. Um, and then you can start to maybe fuel differently and um, try to change a, a few things. If you're having problems, if you're not having problems, I'd I'm, I'm one of these guys where it's like, don't, don't fix what's already working. Right. Yeah. 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 So, uh, but I will say this too. Like you just have some really curious people that love numbers, love to see what's going on. And there's nothing wrong with wearing a CGM, um, diabetics using yeah. it, the portable yeah. portability of this technology is actually super cool from diabetic, yeah. but like yeah. you can wear one 24 seven if you want. Well, I mean, you see a lot of team sports athletes that are diabetics that wear it now. And it, I think mm -hmm. it's a big advantage in that, in that particularly Huge. in that application, because before they'd have to go to the sideline and it's kind of an invasive process to, you know, make sure they're, make sure their insulin levels are, are where they need to be so that they don't have a, some sort of health event right out there on the totally. court or out there on the practice field. So things like this from a safety perspective, I think are super beneficial. It's yeah. interesting. You mentioned that I want to, I'm, I'm going to go low carb thing just to kind of see what happens. And part of the reason I mm -hmm. appreciate you is because you're kind of willing to tinker, but when these came out, I just, I just have to laugh at this. Cause I think, you know, where I'm going with it, the low carb in the keto community went, I'm going to use this pun intentionally. They went bananas. Like, mm -hmm. seriously, like they just like, really, they're like in, in the wrong way. And mm -hmm. here's where they really screwed it up. You, you alluded to this very, you alluded to this earlier. They were conflating acute spikes in blood glucose with long-term health outcomes mm -hmm. during exercise, which is even worse. I mean, normally you wouldn't even conflate that at rest, right? You have an acute hormonal or, or, or substance, uh, spike. And you would never conflate that with like long-term health outcomes, but particularly during exercise where you're having all of these short-term events go on that are three, four, five, 10 X of what they are at rest. You would never say that, oh, long, you know, you can't do this short-term because long-term this is going to be this, but for whatever reason, the low carb and the keto community, they just went ape shit over these spikes that would happen during normal bouts of exercise and would do anything possible to try to minimize it in order to achieve this like long-term health goal. And it, what it really demonstrated to me was like a fundamental misunderstanding of hormonal response and its meaning in long-term health outcomes. hundred percent. And it, this, this probably rub some people the wrong way and ruffle some feathers, but like, it's because, you know, they, they've created a religion about it. Right. Yeah. Right? No, it's, and it is a religion. Yeah. If it helps anybody on, I, I don't, I think it was on either a super sapiens university or it was on the, we nutrition with Oscars. You can, I, I yeah. did an online yeah. university, but Keith Barr came on and Keith Barr is like Mr. Keto. Right. Yeah. And what he said, was, and he's talking to an endurance community. Okay. Endurance athletes. And what he said was, Hey, look, keto is, pretty good for some of the members of your team, but not all keto is good for the mechanics, the team director, <laughs> everybody that's sitting in the car for eight hours a day doing nothing, but for the endurance athlete, it's not the best. Oh, that's so good. I love that quote. I'm going to find and this that is somewhere. like the that's main brilliant. researcher in yeah, the yeah. keto community. So yeah. for anybody, like, yeah. follow Keith Barr on Twitter and read his stuff and you'll realize the religion is just a religion. All right, we got to get off of that before the Twitter yeah. Yeah. censors yeah. us somehow or the totally. keto community censors us somehow, figures out a way. All right, next topic. Spotify will take you down, Coop. Spotify, let's not talk about that. I don't have a $200 million Spotify contract, so nobody's worried about me. <laughs> um, okay, next topic, man. Yeah. Training intensity distribution. <clears throat> yeah, get ready for this one. 
So um, we started out chit chatting. I don't know if I'm going to leave this in the podcast or not, but we started chit, uh, we started out by chit chatting about uh, Neil Vanderpost training manifesto that he recently released that both you and I got a hold of and everybody seems to read and everybody from the New York times to your Saturday afternoon blogger is kind of given their, you know, two cents on the whole application, but it provides a really good launching point to talk about this concept of training intensity distribution. And you and I have been coaching long enough that we have seen all of the cycles of this where first or for a while it's high intensity and everybody's got to do high intensity stuff and Tabata intervals are the rage and you have to go 30 seconds hard and 30 seconds easy. I mean, that's the old Varank Balat, you know, uh, research back in the 1980s where she came up with that, uh, where she came up with that protocol. She's a uh, ultra marathon runner. If you didn't know that. Good, Ooh, uh, I didn't, yeah, I didn't yeah, know that actually. Fun factoid. She won like Zagama in like 82 or something like that. Or somebody fact check. I think it was Zagama. Fun fact Friday. Right there. Yeah, there you go. So anyway, but we've seen this, this training and distribution story play out where at a, one period of time, it's all the rage to do super high intensity at another period of time then you're doing threshold work for whatever reason there's a and usually it's catalyzed by an elite athlete that does a lot of one particular type of intensity and is very successful threshold becomes the thing to do there's an athlete out there that does a shit ton of threshold work they produce a training manifesto and then everybody else kind of follows and makes a big deal out of it and then that fizzles away after three or four years and then oh now it's zone two Zone two is all the rage and here's all this research about zone two, re about zone two and, and how great it is. And here are all these athletes that do 99 or 95% of their training when you're looking at it by time in, in the zone two intensity. So everybody needs to do zone two intensity. And I should actually write this down on a piece of paper and put it in my safe and pull it out five years from now. Five years from now, it'll come back full circle to something else where it'll be some other different type of type of intensity distribution. And I don't know what the practical application of that is, but I kind of wanted to get your thoughts on it, having seen the circles and the cycles kind of go around so much that maybe I'm just getting too cynical about it. But I kind of look at the current wave, which I would define as the zone two wave as a, just another iteration in this long history of being over fascinated with one particular type of intensity over another. And eventually it just switches to something else for some kind of random reason. It almost seems like. Yeah. A uh, nail on the head there. I mean, it's history repeats itself. There's nothing new under the sun, all these concepts, right? Like human history. And it, it spans from uh, uh, philosophy to religion to exercise physiology and training modalities, right? Uh, nutrition and hydration. Mm -hmm. And so I think that as you zoom out and just observe us as human beings and the cyclical nature of thought patterns and stuff that's hot, stuff that's new, it's really not, nothing ever is. And so as... Maybe you are cynical. I don't know. I, th I think it's hilarious because I sit here and it's like, oh yeah, we're talking about this again. Great. I know. And, this, is, this is exactly, I'm like, we're talking about this again. Yeah. Training intensity distribution, but it's just a different one. Right. Right. But it's, you know, what's fun about it is you, I think as I age as a coach too, you can then um, speak to it with a little bit more wisdom or just a little bit more like of a neutral energy. Because like, yeah, zone two. We've known about zone two forever. It's great. And yeah, threshold. We've known about that forever. It's great. Polarized training. It's a, it's a way of finding your rhythm in training. Yeah, we've known about that forever. It's great. Right. But then having a conversation about finding the rhythm for an athlete throughout a year or training cycle or whatever. Um, but, you know, that's a more important aspect. However, I think what's really good about the here and now and say zone two and uh, Vanderpool's uh, manifesto is <laughs> I guess what I took out of it was a lot of beer, a lot of ice cream, and a lot of volume <laughs> makes you a world champion, right? Just kidding. Um, but uh, you know, the zone two or aerobic capacity, building aerobic capacity <clears throat> does take time. Yeah. And I use zone two in my training. Okay. When I have volume, I use it. All right. If I don't have volume, I'm going to manipulate intensity for a certain time period. Right. But when I need performance, I'm going to manipulate intensity, bring down volume a little bit. And so, but then it's always this 
dial up, dial down sort of approach based on the athletes, where the athletes at, what their goals are, where we're at in a training phase, all this kind of stuff. But doing a lot of training does work. Yeah. Well, I, vo volume is the ultimate performance modulator, right? And yeah. within about 10%, meaning if I had two athletes that were equally talented, the one that does the most volume is typically typically going to win unless the training architecture is really screwed up. And you see that yeah. every once in a while, yeah. you definitely see that. But if you got two reasonably good coaches, the one that can kind of squeeze out the most volume is going to win. Now, that's not to go out and say, go do 30 hours a week like near Vanderpols is doing. Most people on a five day per week program, by the way, that's a big that's a that's a big you know caveat that most people miss there. Five days per week, six hours a day. That means you start training at nine and you don't finish until 10, one, two, three, four, five. You don't finish until 5 p.m. If you start at 9 a.m. every day, five days per week. It's a work that's day. A work day. It's a yeah. total work day. So straight up. <clears throat> that's not to say go out and be a volume monger, but typically volume is going to be the biggest indicator of ultimate adaptation and, and, and success. And when we look at the intensity distribution that kind of goes within that volume, yes, it is going to matter, but it's only going to matter secondary to the overall volume in, in an endurance sport with some caveats. And I kind of give a 10% caveat of the volume on the top, meaning you've got somebody that's training. Let's just take Neil, for example, right? You have somebody that's training 30 hours per week and somebody that's training 30, 30, 33 hours per week. I think you might be able to get the 30 hour per week person better with super smart architecture as compared mm -hmm. to the 33. If the, mm -hmm. if the other person's training 36 hours versus 30, I don't think there's anything you can do as long as you're not being dumb, right? As long mm -hmm. as you're not just everything is at one intensity or what, or something just kind of completely off the wall, which none of those elite athletes, uh, 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 really do. And so I think people need to be mindful of that is that this, there's this yep. big hammer out there. That's volume as much as I'm an advocate for intensity in an ultra endurance sport, I'm still a pragmatist. <laughs> I realize that volume kind of, you know, trumps, trumps everything out there. Um, I'm reminded of a strategy that. Lindsay and Dean Golich really impressed upon me many, many years ago. So shout out to those two people. When we were discussing this exact same thing during the threshold craze, which was probably 10 years ago, Adam, when everybody was doing threshold work, you yeah. know, it was like, it was the most improvable system, right? That was the tagline. Yeah, that we uh, had with threshold the company work. we worked for wrote several books about it. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's true from a physiological standpoint, you can get yeah. that needle to move more than the VO2 max needle. Absolutely. Totally. But um, the my, my point with that is, is we were having these during the during the during, if we replace the zone two craze with the threshold craze of 10 years ago, coaches and athletes were kind of making the same mistakes is they were, they were buying into the the hype a little bit too much and shading their training too much towards the thing that was getting put in front of them by the media all too often and that was th that was threshold training yep. and i remember dean and Lin it, dean and lindsay kind of saying con concurrently they're like listen if you're talking about periodization you can't go wrong with starting with the the physiological aspects that are the least specific to the event and then moving to the things that are most specific. You can take any athlete in any endurance domain across any discipline and use that strategy of tuning the most physiologically relevant aspects to the race, the closest to the race, and then the furthest away tuning the least specific ones. And then everybody starts like, their hair starts getting put on fire because inevitably what it, that does is it violates a lot of the periodization principles that that have been established for long periods of time, which is you need to build ba base build first. You have to build base build, you have to base build first and then move to higher intensities, which if you were in, in a very low intensity event, you would think about that in the opposite realm, right? Where you're not doing the low intensity first, you're doing the low intensity stuff last. So I cut whenever I, whenever these conversations about training intensity distribution or polarized training or zone two this, or it'll be something 
6.2 millimoles of lactate is the magical, you know, lactate. I'm, it's going to be something like that. Somebody timestamp this. Yeah. It's going to be the magical intensity she that produces. That. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to trademark it. Yeah. yeah. I'll come up with a book. 6.2 millimoles. I'm going to, I'm going to file for the patent now. <laughs> Just randomly <laughs> guessing at the number. Um, whatever thing, whatever training intensity du jour kind of comes up, you can't go wrong with that initial, that original principle with least specific to most specific, because still everything is physiologically, everything is physiologically rooted and there is no magic intensity that is markedly superior, superior to the rest of them. Although you need a different mix depending upon the athlete that you're working with. Yes. hundred percent. As I'm sitting here and if people are watching on zoom, I oftentimes stare up at a wall or whatever, when I'm thinking whatever, but I, I think that like we, we have to give athletes and human beings a little bit of grace here because we, we fall I'm not short. very good at that, by the way. You yeah, know I know me. you're not, which is why, <laughs> this is why I brought you on <laughs> this is why I'm to here. give everybody a big hug. That's right. Everybody it's hug time. Hold hands. Um, <clears throat> exercise physiology is a pretty young thing. Right. True. So when we're talking about periodization, Tudor Bumpa, right? Kind of like the grandfather, if you will, of periodization. Um, what it eighties? Is that when he was writing his books or like eighties? Uh, earlier than that. I think it was in the seventies, but yeah. Seventies. Okay. Four decades. So, all right. So four decades worth. And all of that modeled approach or all that planning was born out of what the Eastern Bloc, right? And which the, is an issue. I know where you're going with this. Issue. All right. So like it or not, folks, the periodization models that we love and use were born out of steroid cycles, three up, one down. Exactly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because they needed to take the drugs away for a little bit in order to reintroduce them back in so that they would have a better effect. They couldn't. And so when they took the drugs out, the athletes couldn't do the training as hard. So they had to reduce training. Then they brought the drugs back in, then you could do more training and then away you went. So these three up one. So then all of a sudden they're like, well, what if we just took this concept, but took away the drugs? And we're like, oh, that works too. Because of uh, gas principle, general adaptation syndrome from um, um, Hansellier, Hansel, Hansellier, am I saying that wrong? Yeah. Hansellier. And so you take these principles and you, you say, well, why, why do we have what they are now? And you observe it for what it is. And you're like, well, that's crazy. A lot of people are like, oh, I'd never do that. But what we're learning, we're evolving over time, very short history of exercise physiology and periodization and all this kinds of, we're still figuring it out. We still don't know what causes fatigue, right? right. There's multiple things. Very going. simple. Yeah. Very simple. Yeah. Okay. And so as we're learning over time, we're, we're scrubbing the process and we're getting things better. But this is where humans, again, fall short. We always want the quick fix. We always want the shiny, fancy thing. We want results now, okay? And this is why whatever craze is going on, whatever elite athlete is setting world records and whatever they're drinking, eating, pooping, or wearing, or using, whatever, I want that. And it, it's just human nature to do that. And I think the longer you live, hopefully you've realized that it's like fluff and stuff, right? Well, Yeah. I think, I think all to your point on the history piece of it, all coaches are really well served to understand that history because many times <clears throat> what we're just, we're just beg borrowing and stealing training structure and principles from people that have developed them 20 or 30 years ago. And it's in, 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 in many cases, some cases they're going to remain the same in other cases, they absolutely need to evolve. The three to one principle, I remember when I came out of the, when I came out with the very first edition of my book, I actually used this as kind of like an anecdote to like lead into why I wrote the book. Uh, very early on in my coaching uh, career, Jim Lehman actually asked me that very question. He's like, why do you have three weeks of build and one week of rest? And I was like, fuck, I don't have a good answer to that. Like, I don't, I don't know. Cause that's what I did in college. Cause that's what I saw in Jack Daniels, tra Jack Daniels yeah. training formula. Like I couldn't explain it physiologically is what mm -hmm. he was trying to get at. I couldn't explain why an athlete needed three weeks of an overload cycle and then one week or five days 
of a deloading cycle in order to produce adaptation. I couldn't explain why that, why those time frames were not necessary. Why, why is it not one on one off? Why is it not two on one? Why is it not three days on one day off? Like what? Like you know, tell me what's going on physiologically. Mm -hmm. And it made me come to the conclusion that we were all just being lazy. Like we use this three to one cycle all too often and we still, mm -hmm. you do it, I do it. We can probably look at training peaks right now and 80% of our athletes have some semblance of that in there. We're all just kind of being lazy because we don't know a better way to explain it. And so my point with that is, is a lot of young coaches out there and athletes that are trying to DIY their training, they would be really well served to understand some of the history of that because it makes you think about it in a different in a different context and very specifically with this three to one it the genesis of that is largely not exclusively but largely rooted in the drug cycles that you had mentioned earlier and i will also say with a lot of females because mm -hmm. they were very susceptible to that three to one cycle matching up with their with their menstrual cycle and once you realize that and if you're patterning your training with your athletes around that same three to one pattern you have to realize how irrelevant it is because your athletes are hopefully not doped up Eastern Bloc women. Hopefully, well, right? You know, I mean, sure. if they are, then I guess you can match that pattern. But I mean, you know, our, I don't have any athletes that fit that. I haven't, I've never had an athlete that fits that category. So mm -hmm. we just have to watch it, I guess, when we're blindly regurgitating patterns. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Right. And, and I think, um, that's where in my, um, college education, I had a pretty unique experience and, uh, mad respect and kudos to Dennis Klein, who is still to this day, one of the smartest guys I know he's, he's like, um, Dean Golich of strength training. Oh, wow. Okay. okay. Very simple to the point, like you either love him or you hate him. There's nothing yeah, yeah, yeah. And fancy about it. Right. But that he was, as we're studying periodization, he's like, no, we don't need to do that. I'm like what? And this is where, uh, you remember the term undulating periodization? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> this is a little like kind of, I forgot, totally forgot about that until you mentioned it. That's another one. <laughs> yeah. Undulating periodization is the next one. Yeah. Where it's just like, um, <laughs> it's just like Picasso, right. For, for coaches, you know, just a little bit of this, a little bit of that, dial this down, dial that up. And as long as you could describe it with what you want, as long as you had a method uh, and the athlete didn't get hurt, sure. Okay. But it comes down to being able to rationalize and explain what you're doing, why you're doing it. And hopefully you're following some sort of progressive overload if that's, if that's your goal. But I think that coming back to the point, which you just described where we're at, I think with many endurance, uh, coaches and the, the overall philosophy is being able to, um, br you know, start with what is least specific and bring the athlete and train what is more specific into that event, just as a very general concept really can't go wrong with that. Most people understand that too. That's why I yeah. like to present it like that. And that's why I think that, yeah. you know, that one statement was probably 15 years ago from Dean and Lindsay really yeah. resonated with me because I can explain that to anybody and they kind of get it. Right. Mm -hmm. um, okay. That's enough about training intensity distribution. You get the last one, Adam. I want to know what you're into. I'm always curious what is dangling in the back of Adam's brain. And this is a chance for me to publicly try to pull it out of you. <laughs> what is going on in Adam's brain right now? The, I mean, there's a lot and I, and I would be, I'd be a liar to say that. Um, it's just like a, building aerobic capacity and how best to do that because everybody's talking about zone two and all this kind right. of stuff, right. not to like jump on bandwagons <clears throat> or anything like that. But as, as I coach my like elite, women that's i don't have any elite men right now but then as i coach my amateur folk it's like the the <laughs> the intensity and volume distribution are, are much different right between right. the two right and when i have people who are like i'm not i can't ride the trainer or oh, i can't i can't do those intervals or whatever it's like all right well fine i'll give you four 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 three and then rest, rest, whatever. It, it kind of like 
you know, a very volume based overload. Hours. Deck. You're talking about hours. Hours. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And if I even like, you know, jokingly like bring this up, okay, five, four, four. And for somebody who's training, you know, uh, maybe eight to 10 hours a week or something like that, blow them up and yeah, okay. right. It'd crush them. Right. It'd crush right. Them. So it's like, okay, well, if you can't do that volume, we then need to do these intervals. Right. And so you walk through the, the rationale of that. But then it's like, how do I get, you know, my amateur athletes to not only kind of buy into, this aerobic capacity building, but how I find time to do that. And I think like what I'm, what I'm trying to set up for people who can is just the concept of camps. Yeah. Camps to prepare them for what they're 20, because everybody's like stoked on 2022, like calendars are like more yeah. normative, like people are getting excited in there. People got some huge um, challenges going on, but they, they need the development, right? They need that volume. And so, full knowing that we need this volume. How do I get it when everybody's like working remote and doing all this kind of stuff? So my mind has been a little bit in how do I get my amateurs to build more aerobic capacity on less time and I'll cue it over to you. Cause it's like, if all you got, is 10 hours. All you got is 10 hours. Well, so there's, here you go. Here's your next, uh, here's your next training phenomenon to hit the airwaves and the magazine pages is, the we got to give it a fancy name. The volume camp, over camp the based vo approach. No, nah, it can't be camp because that's like it makes it sound like summer camp or something like that. You got to give it like a technical name, right? Zone two, right? It's kind of a technical name. Zone makes it seem seem, seem somehow scientific. Not to diminish it at all, but it, no. it gives it gives you that or so it's going to be the the volume a concentrated volume overload training which is a camp setup. And so it's for the, for the listeners to describe that since Adam and I kind of like glossed over it, we've always been in the situation with our training camps with our athletes and which we usually coach at where we have normal people that have a normal work life, eight to five job. They work 40 to 50 hours a week and they come to our training camps and regardless of what they're training for, whether it's a running event or cycling event, or triathlon event, <clears throat> they can carve out three to four days, and usually about triple their volume. Mm -hmm. So if they're doing an hour and a half a day, they can come in and do four and a half hours a day in training. Like how I did that math in my head, right? One and mm -hmm. a half, three, yeah. four and a half. It's pretty good for me. Um, and they handle it just fine. Mm -hmm. And not only do they handle it just fine, they come out the other end with like a month's worth of overload, meaning they can kind of get like a month's worth of adaptation overload. It's not the right word. They can kind of get a month's worth of adaptation out of that three or four day period because That's better way of saying it. Yeah. Because it's a, it's so concentrated. Right. And B it's just a lot of volume going back to our earlier point where volume is, is, is kind of the key. Mm -hmm. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I got interviewed, uh, on a, for another podcast that came, that just came out today is where we're, is we're recording this. Uh, it's a strength running podcast. I'll leave a link in the show notes to it. And he asked me just that, uh, in a different context. Hmm. So the context was, how do you have, how do you get people adapted to the up and down nature of trail and ultra running if they live in the flats? So there's a lot of muscle damage, right? Specifically on the eccentric component. How do you actually do that? And I said, listen, if you don't live in the mountains, you got to carve out a training camp. And that's because the effect of that takes a low dose and you can also get a high concentration of dose kind of all in one shot. And if you can time it like three to four weeks before your event, you can take advantage of all of the legacy of the eccentric adaptations that you're, uh, uh, that you're getting. So I think you're onto something there. Maybe we can like start up another LLC and call it, what did I just call it's it? Opening. Volume overload, volume concentration overload incorporated or something like that Dude, we're just going to call it coupling camp no, coupling camp um but but to that end i think for listeners as well it's you know i've been and, and this is no no marketing scheme okay um but the, this camp based thing I, it's it's fun people can do it you take your you can take your family with you or you go solo have a have a weekend to yourself this kind of thing but it is it is what moves the needle if you're only yeah. doing 15 hours a week i mean it, some point you just top out and to make this applicable to make this conversation applicable and you're looking at the sheer volume that Vanderpool's doing and you're like what no ways 
superhuman. Well, he doesn't have a job. Like there's nothing else to do. And yeah, his job is a sport, right? His job is a sport, right? And so when we, when Coop and I have been working camps and we make, we make you professional athletes for the weekend, eat, sleep, train, repeat, right? And it's, it is astonishing what you're able to do when you have nothing else to do. Right. So that is absolutely true. I mean, yeah. it, 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 unfortunately today it's hard. It's a little bit harder because our devices make it so accessible to kind of like get back Turn to work off. and get back to, yeah. I mean, we used to, we used to be able to make that argument. You remember we used to do camps where like, we'd say, oh, well, we put did, your yeah. black, put your Blackberry down. This will date the camp, <laughs> put your Blackberry down for the next few days. It'll do you a lot of good. And, and the yeah. devices weren't as addictive as they are. I, I gotta be careful when I use that word. They weren't as uh, compelling to use as they are nowadays, and um, we can't get away with that statement anymore. Just, the, the, the devices are going to be there. We kind of can't fight that battle. But to Adam, to your point, I'm no longer astonished at the volume increases that I can see in these environments, and I think it's really freaking cool. Like I just mm-hmm. when I when I see that, and everybody gets scared when they see it on paper particularly in a running perspective, right? Because it's a little Mm -hmm. bit more problematic for the acute uh, increases in volume. But they look at it and they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like I'm running 10K a day. You know, Mm -hmm. I'm running 60 minutes a day. You expect me to run four to five hours for three days in a row? I mean, and that's like, they might as you might as well put them on Mars or whatever. It's that out of this world to them. But I just say, listen, just trust me. You know, I make all the compelling arguments. You're going to you know, eat, sleep, train, repeat, all that kind of stuff. We're going to have food and all this kind of jazz. But when they get there, when they get there, and usually after the second day, after they're super fatigued and they've got to get up the next day and do it again, they kind of get it. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's, the reason I think it's really neat is because then they have the confidence and also kind of like the skill set of how to set it up to DIY it in the future. So they're not reliant on me my calendar and my availability to do this yep. camp for them they can kind of do it on there which makes it more powerful because they can do it more frequently and yep. if you can carve that out like it just takes like three times a year mm-hmm. super powerful like it's a super powerful training intervention to use and pro- out of all the stuff that we just talked about that i'm thinking about it freaking glucose monitors and hydration sensors and power meters and whatever else we can come up with the simple training camp training camp is it's the sharpest that's the sharpest knife that's it damn mm-hmm. there's the business right there <clears throat> crushed it yeah crushed it man cool that's a perfect yeah. place to put a pin in it as the cliche goes my friend yeah I love we gotta it. do this more often let's do it i think next time we cannot because another thing that i really liked about that vanderpool is uh he fucking so the whole process right but he capitalized the word the limit <laughs> like, I guess a, like and you a know where i'm going <laughs> yeah for sure but it's like the edge right go find yeah, the edge yeah, what yeah. we've talked about right but like yeah. the limit and because he, he like madly respects the limit and you can see him like he's got this like little limiter this like the limit on one shoulder and like the give up on the other or something i don't know and he's just like <laughs> dealing with him like we gotta talk about that I don't know. I'll do something. Definitely don't put this in your podcast. No, I'm going to leave it in because it's fun. (laughs) Uh, Adam, if people want to follow you on social for the awesome content you put out, which by the way, you got to bring back more WKO5 content, man. Come on. Can I I go into doing it? I love it. I know it's not the most engaging stuff in the world, but come on, man. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you're committing to not Strava. I'm going to commit to more social media just for there you. There we go. Gosh, um, yeah. I feel bad if there's, there's some sort of ill effects on your <laughs> professional or personal life because nah. of this. But. I'll do less selfies, more WKO, and it's going to be awesome. Um, but you, okay, So if, if people are interested, and in particular, one cool piece that I just put on Instagram was me and one of my other athletes, DJ Brew, um, oh, this is a funny story, by the way. I don't know if we have time, Coop, but um, so I gave him a one by 90 tempo and this guy's a sprint. We're building up all this kinds of, but he's a sprinter. So a one by 90 minute interval, like he was freaking out on like a one by 45, like <laughs> a while back. And so I gave him one by 90 and he's like, Mm-mm, no, I'm like, yes. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do it too. So, but I kind of forgot about it. Right. 
So when I saw, I was like going through files. I'm like, oh, shoot. DJ's got this one by 90. I got to do this on Saturday. I'm going to do it on the trainer, blah, blah, blah. However, I was like busy where, and I did like a couple group rides during, I did like group ride Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then it like snowed. So I'm like, I'll just do an hour of tempo. And then I'm just going to like mail it in over the weekend. Right. I forgot about the one by 90. So that is what people don't know when they have read this on my Instagram thus far. So I go into this one by 90, just super loaded up, like four days of training going in. DJ blew it out of the water. He was awesome because I brought him in fresh, all this kind of stuff. Coach AP was on the struggle bus, just like drinking all the hydro gels and fans and wahoos and everything to keep my mind off of this. And so anyway, I did a nice side-by-side comparison looking at heart rate to coupling, power production, power to weight ratio, uh, uh, phenotype of rider, all this kind of stuff. So I did that. You can find it on Instagram at adam.pulford. And then I talk about all this kind of crazy stuff on the train right podcast, which you can also find wherever you do podcasting stuff. Um, Apple podcasts, Spotify, Google thingy. So that's about where I'm active. Sometimes I just retweet stuff for coop and then Facebook is weird to me. So your podcast is good. You and uh, Corinne do a great job with it. I listen to it. Cool. Now that that should be a marker of your success, but for the listeners out there, if you want to know what I listen to, it's Adam and Corinne's podcast. They do a great job. Yeah. Of it. I appreciate that. Corinne, Corinne knocks it out of the park. She's, she's amazing. So I'm just trying to keep up to her. Yeah. Yeah. That's a hard, yeah. that's a hard wheel to follow. Very All hard. right, my friend, we're yep. gonna let you go. Peace. Thanks very much. Yeah. Peace thanks. Scoop. Bye. All right, folks. There you have it. There you go. Much thanks to Adam for coming on the podcast today. I really hope that brought you guys into the middle of a normal coaching conversation that we have all about shooting the stuff and what is new and what we are excited about. I want to bring Adam and some of our other coaches back on the podcast for more of these kind of like casual conversations about what is getting us excited in the endurance space today because I think that the colloquial nature of discussing those things and what we really think about it in an unfiltered fashion offers some nuggets and some tidbits of wisdom. So put that as a note and I'll file it away for the future. As I mentioned during the outro of the podcast last week, the Coopcast is just about to cross 1 million downloads, or maybe it will have crossed it by the time this podcast actually comes out. So thank you to each and every one of the listeners for making that happen. I'm very humbled that that many downloads have occurred and this many people listen to this podcast week after week after week. It is something that has exceeded my wildest expectations and I'm incredibly grateful to have this platform and you all are the centerpiece of that gratitude. So thank you very much. You can help this podcast out a lot by sharing it with your friends and your training partners and giving it a rating or review on Apple Podcasts. That helps the podcast out very, very much. It's not the easiest thing you get yet to get to. You have to go to Apple Podcasts, scroll all the way to the bottom, write a review, but I'm incredibly appreciative of each one of those reviews that come across the wire. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. That is it for today, folks. And as always, we will see you out on the trails.